Hey there folks, welcome back for module 16 of CompTIA A+. Today's module is called Configuring SOHO Network Security. Now if you don't know what SOHO stands for, that's an abbreviation for Small Office Home Office. Alright, so what is in store for today's module? There is four main sections folks. The first one is Attacks, Threats and Vulnerabilities. Second main section is compare wireless security protocols. The third section is configure small office home office router security. And the fourth and the last one is summarize security measures. So there we're just going to do a bit of a summary of some random security stuff. I'm going to be honest, uh, the, the fourth section is a bit boring. It's obvious stuff. I mean, literally like what is a pad lock? What is a cabinet? I kid you not, that's what it is. So if you feel like you want to skip that, that section, you're more than welcome to do that because there's no questions about that actually in the exam. It is still part of the course though, which is why I'm covering it. So let it not be said that I did not cover something which was in the course. It is in the course, I'm covering it, but you don't need to know that fourth section for the exam. Now as for the first, the second and the third section, folks, those ones are very important if any of you guys plan on writing the exam. Um, but if you're just bored, you know what, watch the fourth section too. So for those of you that's brand new to the channel, welcome. For those of you coming back, welcome back. For those of you that don't know this yet, um, the sections is obviously just the main sections. That's not an indication of what's actually in the module per se. If you'd like a more accurate idea of what's in this specific module, you can find that in the video description down below. And I've also added nice little convenient timestamps there, you know, just so you can find what you're looking for a lot quicker and a lot easier. All right, guys, uh, this is the part where you give me a like or I'm going to come and throw a bunch of bugs in your bed. No, I'm just kidding. I won't do that. So if you feel this course is helping you, I will appreciate it if you give the video a like so I can help more people out there. If you'd like an indication of when the next module comes out or some of my other nonsense, then I don't know, maybe consider subscribing. Otherwise, you might not be informed of it. All right, let's show you guys quickly my cool new intro. Let me know in the comment section down below what you think of this intro. Do you like it? Do you not like it? Is it too long? Is it too short? Um, I'm playing of something new here. So yeah, let me know what you think of the intro. And then if it sucks, then I'll just remove it from the CompTIA course, obviously, as well. Alright guys, there's my short little intro like I said. Let me know down in the comment section what you guys think of it. Let's move into that first main section which is attacks, threats and vulnerabilities. The first thing we're going to be talking about in this section is information security. More specifically, information security CIA triad. Very first thing I want to mention here about this guys is do not confuse the CIA with the one that you get in the United States. Not to be confused with that, this abbreviation stands for something entirely different. Now, because there's some confusion here sometimes, CompTIA says, and I disagree with them here, CompTIA says this is sometimes referred to as AIC. You literally take the three letters and you go and write it down in reverse. That's to avoid confusion. So sometimes it's written like that. That's what CompTIA says. Now, I've been in IT for a very long time, for decades, and I can tell you I've never seen that. I've never heard of anyone mention it like that, so I think that's po total bogus, in my opinion. But I'm mentioning it anyway, just in case it's a question in the exam. I've never seen that as a question in the exam, though, but you never know. I don't trust CompTIA, and because I don't trust them, I'm going to mention it to you guys. So what exactly does CIA stand for? The C, guys, stands for Confidentiality. So what is confidentiality? That is to ensure, um, if you look at something like data, that is just to ensure that it's only for the people's eyes who it was intended for. This could be something like your salary slip, your pay slip, bank statement, you know, anything that's sensitive in nature. You do not want anyone else seeing that. So confidentiality would be kind of that. How do we ensure confidentiality? Now, this topic is not, you know, about how do we actually, you know, achieve these goals, but, you know, in case you guys are curious, to ensure confidentiality, that would be to, you know, password protected document, perhaps. You know, you'll find a lot of documents these days. If you try and open them up, let's say it's a bank statement, 
it's not going to open up until you type in some sort of password, which could be your social security number, your ID number, you know, something in that regard. And that will allow you to view the contents inside, thus giving you confidentiality. Another way to achieve this would be to use encryption. Now be careful, you do get different kinds of encryption out there. So this is specifically the encryption type that does not allow you or the user to view the contents until you decrypt the contents. That kind of encryption. All right, so what is the I in CIA? That stands for integrity. So this is to ensure the data or whatever this is we're dealing with is authentic. It's original. It has not been tampered with. Now, don't get this confused of confidentiality. Integrity does not necessarily mean someone cannot see the contents. So integrity, you know, I could see the contents. I just can't tamper with it without you knowing about it. So one of the ways we achieve that is to use certificates of some kind. You also get different kinds of encryption. You know, that's a different kind of encryption that does not give you confidentiality. Although, there are encryptions out there that actually gives you integrity and confidentiality, but we're not talking about that right now. So as for integrity, let's say this is a contract. That's going to be an actual piece of paper, folks. So what do we normally do when we have a contract? We would sign it, right? I'm going to sign it. You're going to sign it. That might be a contract between me and you. And if I were to go and try and change this contract in any manner, try and alter it, perhaps, I can go and re-sign it. But you know what's going to be missing? Your signature. And if your signature is missing, you're going to know something is up. Because why is your signature missing? It's no longer authentic. It's no longer the original. Someone, in this case me, would have tampered with it. Now, this is not just physical pieces of paper, folks. This can obviously be something like an actual digital document. It can be an email. And one of the ways we ensure that, which is not actually part of this topic, is to go and use something like a digital signature, maybe a password, you know, that kinds of stuff. What is the A in CIA? That, folks, is availability. Ensuring the data that your people are working with, that you're working with, that your users are working with, ensuring that the data is always available. So if this data is perhaps being hosted on a server of sorts, you want to make sure that server has got high availability, redundancy, full tolerance. So if God forbid something happens, the data at no point in time was inaccessible. Also ensuring that you know your users have just got plain the right permissions, the right privilege to be able to access this data. It can honest to God be something that simple, folks. Now, since we're talking about CIA, another term you guys will come across when we talk about CIA is cyber security. Now, cyber security on, on its own is a pretty broad you know, term. It can mean a lot of things, but in this sense, we're talking about it or coming at it from a CIA perspective. So this is where information security relates to ensuring data is stored and processed with CIA attributes in electronic or printed formats. Cybersecurity also refers specifically to controls that protect against attacks on computer storage and processing systems. So it's all about how do you store your data, where do you store your data, what do you do to protect that data. This is basically what the cybersecurity aspect comes down to. And one of the ways we ensure that this is actually happening is to go and do what we call assessments. So by doing assessments, you can ensure that this stuff is actually being practiced, that people are actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. Otherwise, you know, people could say, hey, we are, we're doing it. But meanwhile, they're not actually doing it. So assessments is a very good way to ensure that this stuff is actually taking place the way it's supposed to. Right, folks, let's move on to the second topic, vulnerabilities. Oh, gosh, I hope I pronounced that correctly and didn't butcher it. So the first thing in this section or this topic is non-compliant systems. Now, saying systems makes this sound very fancy, makes it sound like rocket science. But it's most of the time going to be something as simple as your laptop or your desktop. Now, so many people are working from wherever these days and using so many devices. We obviously know that saying system does not necessarily mean it's a laptop or a desktop. It's going to be something like a tablet. It can be something like a phone. Uh, but we're going to come at this from a laptop or a desktop perspective because that's mostly what they've got in mind here. So when we say non-compliant systems in the category of vulnerabilities, that could be a system that is now maybe maybe not joined to your domain. That's a bit of a security concern for some companies. It can be a system that does not have MFA on it, multi-factor authentication. So that is when you or the user have to prove in more than one way they are who they claim to be or what they claim to be. 
So instead of just providing a traditional username and password, they would also have to provide something like a pen, maybe a fingerprint, you know, something in that regard. So that would be seen as, you know, added security to the system. Another way or another reason why a system might not be compliant is because it does not have the right operating system installed on it. Maybe your company or your client's company prefers to use only Windows or only iOS or only Android for whatever reason. Maybe when it comes to Windows, let's keep it simple here, you need to have a certain edition installed. It needs to be a certain build that's installed and you need to make sure you've got the latest updates installed. It doesn't help you don't have updates installed. Otherwise, you know, you're leaving yourself wide open for attack. It can also be other factors like maybe this person just doesn't have an antivirus installed or maybe they do, but it hasn't been updated in years. So all of these are things that contribute to a system being non-compliant or being seen as non-compliant. Your system or your, your company systems have certain criteria they need to meet. They have to have a certain edition of Windows, has to be a certain build or edition, has to have the latest updates, has to have an antivirus. All of these are conditions that need to be met. And failing to meet them would mean you or the user system is now non-compliant. Then they also mention unprotected systems. I think we kind of accidentally just covered that. So that means you obviously don't have something like an antivirus installed. Maybe you do, but it hasn't been updated quite as recently, you know. So that could be a reason for a system to be unprotected. We have something called software and zero-day vulnerabilities. So there are folks out there that's got literally nothing better to do with their time. It's probably someone staying in his mom's basement or something. I've been known to exaggerate. But it's just, I'm trying to paint a picture here for you guys. Someone staying in his mom's basement, he or she has nothing better to do with his time. And what they do is they discover some sort of weakness in a software or an operating system or something in, you know, in that category. And when they discover that weakness, they're going to exploit that weakness or sell it to the highest bidder as quickly as possible before the developers of that software and operating system, you know, catches on. Because if they catch on, they're going to go and fix it. They're going to go and release a patch or an update that basically addresses these security issues. So that is one of the reasons why it's always so important for you to have the latest updates of your operating systems and your softwares. It's not just your operating system, folks. It's also your softwares. And when I say softwares, believe it or not, this is not necessarily your security software. This can be anything on your computer. It can be something as random as Adobe Reader, for crying out loud, which is used for PDF documents. I mean, it's got nothing to do with security. But one day is one day. Someone's going to figure out a weakness in that program. And that could potentially, you know, leave your system wide open for attack. Maybe they can see what you're doing. Maybe it allows them to gain control of your machine or fish information from your machine. And if you don't have the latest updates of that software, you're going to leave your machine wide open for attacks, folks. The fourth thing I'm going to add here for you guys is unpatched and end-of-life operating systems, EOL for short. So unpatched, I mean, that's, I think it speaks for itself. So if someone discovered some sort of weakness in some sort of operating system, you know, or software, in this case, we're talking about operating systems, by you patching your system as regularly, as often as possible, you are ensuring or at least reducing the chances of some weenie out there, you know, taking advantage of these weaknesses. So that's basically what it comes down to. Uh, when we talk about end of life systems, all operating systems and all softwares eventually come to an end where it just no longer gets supported by the developers. And at some point, you know, the operating system or the software might just completely cease to function altogether. So examples of this will probably be something like, something like Windows 7. I mean, I think Windows 8 and 8.1 also fall into this category. And sometime in the foreseeable future, even Windows 10 will fall into this category. When they reach end of life, Microsoft will no longer release updates and patches and they will no longer support you. That does not necessarily mean the operating system won't work. It's just from that point forward, if some weenie out there discovers some sort of weakness, well, you're on your own. Microsoft's not going to address that issue. So which is one of the reasons why we need to run the latest operating systems out there, which at the moment is Windows 11. So whether you like the latest operating system or not, we're kind of forced into it against our will because of reasons like this. And the last thing I'm going to add to this list of vulnerabilities for you folks is bring your own device, better known as BYOD for short. So BYOD vulnerabilities. There's a long, long list of things that can cause issues when you bring your own device. So when we say 
bring your own device. We mean you use your own property, your own laptop, desktop, tablet, or phone for the purposes of work. You're more than likely bringing it into the office. So you bring your own laptop, your own tablet, your own phone to the office and use that for work. Now, if it's your own property, obviously you can go and use this property of yours for, well, personal stuff too. You can go to those not so legal websites and go and download not so legal stuff and you can go and basically get up to all kinds of shenanigans and when you do that a lot of these websites have got all kinds of malware on them and you name it and now you're going to go and take that same device bring it to the office connect it to the office network and you know what's going to happen now? you are going to spread all that malware you got from those not so nice wet not so nice websites you're going to go and spread all of that into your office network not very nice, right? So that device of yours has now been compromised in more than one way, most likely. And yeah, you're putting everyone else at risk. Not very nice, right? So a lot of companies are against these devices for multiple reasons. That being, of course, one of the main reasons. Right, folks, moving on. Here we've got the topic of social engineering. This can be a lot of things. I'm going to give you guys a list of some possibilities of what this could be. Well, when I give you guys this list, please keep it in the back of your mind that what we say here is not limited to just these topics. So social engineering is a very broad term as well. It can mean a lot of things. So the first one I've got here is impersonation, where I or something or someone pretend to be something they're not. And this is to normally go and gain physical or network access. It's not limited to that, but it's usually the reason. So I'm going to go and, for example, copycat your IP address or your MAC address of your machine. My machine is pretending to be your machine so it can go and gain physical access to the network, perhaps. I don't know. So that could be that. Um, I can pretend to be you physically as a human being. So if I pretend to be you at some company or some building, that could potentially give me access to certain things in that building where I would normally not have access. So it could be physical access, can be network access, can be logical access. By pretending to be someone or something I'm not, you could potentially gain more access. Assuming, of course, you've done this correctly. Social engineering, we also have something called dumpster diving. Now, unlike the name suggests here, it's not necessarily someone actually going and jumping into a dumpster and, you know, digging for a bunch of trash. I mean, I could, it could be, but it's not normally what they mean by that. So when we say dumpster, I think what comes to mind here is those dumpsters you find in America. Uh, for those of you who don't know, in America, you get some of these dumpsters, you know, that they throw a lot of trash into. You don't get those in all countries. So, it, you know, a better way to explain dumpster diving for those of you that's not necessarily United States is to think of this as going through someone's trash in the hopes of gaining something of value. Coming across something sensitive, something of value. And this is not necessary to go through the actual trash trash, which has got banana peels and all kinds of rotten stuff in it. No, this can really actually just be a matter of going to that person's desk when they're not there. And if they happen to have like a small little trash bin below their desk, which some folks do quite often, there you would find mostly just, well, pieces of papers, you know, old documents, sticky notes, that kinds of stuff. And if you're really lucky, you might actually find something of value written down on one of these pieces of paper. Someone might have written down a password to something or a bank account number or a credit card number. So, yeah, you might get lucky. You might not get lucky. So dumpster diving is to obtain information to develop attacks. So if I'm lucky, I might get information that is really sensitive, might be of value, and I can use it as is or I can use it to go and plot my attack on your company or your network or your devices, of course. Social engineering also includes something called shoulder surfing. Sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? So shoulder surfing is to observe passwords and confidential information. So how this is done, in case you guys are confused by this, imagine for a moment you stand at an ATM to go and withdraw some money. And if I stand in the queue behind you and I stand close enough, there is a possibility that I could potentially see the keys you're pressing on the keyboard and I can see what your PIN number is. Or there is a possibility that I can see what's on the screen. Other way, that is shoulder surfing. Now, shoulder surfing is not limited to ATMs, obviously not. This can be a matter of you're sitting in the office or standing in the office. I'm in the same room or office. And when you're doing something on your machine, your laptop, your desktop most likely, I can see what keys you're pressing on a keyboard. So if you're logging into a website or something, you know, very confidential, 
I'm paying very close attention to the keys you're pressing on the keyboard. Solder surfing. Or I'm paying very close attention to what is on your screen, but I'm doing it from an angle, from a distance. But close enough to the point where I can actually read what is on your screen. That's also shoulder surfing. So whenever you're about to log into something very secure, guys, make sure someone cannot see your passwords. Now I'm saying this to you guys, and the funny thing is I'm an expert in IT and I'm an expert in cybersecurity, and guess what? I got hacked by a six-year-old. I kid you not, not because he's a hacker or anything fancy like that, just because I'm plain stupid, it happens to the best of us, so I suppose I should go and practice what I preach. What happened to me was, this little six-year-old, um, I've got a bunch of computers in my house, I mean, like you would expect, I'm an IT geek, and they've got posits on them, and that's only so that the kids just don't go and fiddle with stuff they're not supposed to. I'm always concerned they might go and delete something or break something, you know, when there's not adult supervision. And this one day, I saw my six-year-old on the computer, and I'm like, did I forget to lock the PC? Now I'm doubting myself. I think, okay, I thought to myself, okay, you know what, let's just leave it. He's playing there. I can see he's minding his own business. He's watching videos on YouTube or something. So I'm leaving the guy. And the next day, it happens again, and it happens again. Eventually, I'm like, no. I know for a fact this machine was off. It would have asked the kid a password. So I asked my son, how did you get onto this PC? He's like, no, I typed in the password. I'm like, what password? How do you know where the password is? He's like, no, I saw what you were typing. And keep in mind, my password is not an actual word or anything. Mine, like you would expect from any IT guy, is a computer-generated password. It's between 12 and 15 characters, uppercase, lowercase, numbers, and symbols. It's all kinds of random jibber-jabber. And he saw what I was typing on the keyboard probably two or three times in a row, memorized it, and started logging in. So what did he do? Shoulder surfing. I got hacked by a flippin' six-year-old. Can you believe it? It's downright embarrassing is what it is. Anyway, so last topic I'm going to add here under this topic of social engineering is something called tailgating and piggybacking. So unfortunately, it's the last one for social engineering, but guys, social engineering is not limited to these topics, like I said earlier. Tailgating is when you, you know, follow someone in somewhere when you're not supposed to. It's not limited to something physical. It can be digital, but let's use the physical example. So if you wanted to go into an office park or a building that's got lots of doors, these are access control doors, we need a pen, a smart card, or, a, you know, something that regard that maybe it needs to scan your fingerprint before you can open the door. Now, imagine for a moment I'm parking in the basement parking, and for me to get into the building, there's an access door I need to get for this door. I don't work for this company. I, my, my fingerprint's not going to open that door. My PIN number is not going to work because I don't even know a PIN number. So how do I get in there? If I see someone else coming out or going in, I can pretend like I'm working for that company. I can kind of like kind of like speed walk to the door and say, hey, can you hold that door for me, please? And I just do it kind of like the whole idea here is to act like you work there. And the average person would actually leave the door open for you or hold it open for you because that's what we do. We're nice people like that. And where it's even more believable is actually if you pretend like your hands are full. Maybe carry a box, an empty box, but they don't know it's an empty box. So now they're going to feel more inclined to try and help you because they can see you're calling out to them. Hey, please hold out, hold open that door for me. They can kind of see you speeding towards the door. You've got your hands full with this box, which is actually empty. And they feel like, sure, let's, let's help this guy because we can see his hands are full. They hold the door open for you. Boom, bam, you just got in. That is an example of social engineering where you trick them to hold the door open for you. Tailgating is what it is. And you also get piggybacking and all that, which basically falls into the same category, folks. All right, now here we've got the topic of phishing and evil twin. So with regards to phishing, no, that is not a spelling mistake, people. That is how you spell it when we talk about IT and security and, in this case, phishing. So what do we mean when we say Phishing. Phishing in IT is when you or someone evil, let's just call them evil, are fishing for something sensitive, something of value. Many ways you can go about doing that. So whether we're talking about phishing or any of the other things we've spoken about so far, very often you guys will encounter that these attacks, I suppose we can call them attacks, are combined with other forms of attacks. So phishing, an example would be if I send you an email and I pretend to be your bank and I say, hey, We've had a bit of a compromise. Can you please confirm using them in your password? So what I did just there and then is I was basically tricking you or at least some person out there 
into giving me their username and password or something of value. I'm fishing for something of value, something sensitive. I can do this by sending you an email. I can do this by phoning you. I can do this by just talking to you verbally. I can do this by chatting to you on something like Facebook. You name it. I am fishing for sensitive information, something of value. Now, phishing is very commonly combined with an attack called spoofing. For those of you not familiar with spoofing, spoofing is when you're pretending to be something you're not. You're basically forging something. Spoofing is forging something like an IP address, a MAC address, an email address, a phone number. So if I send you an email pretending to be your bank, but you see this email is coming from something something at gmail.com. Now that is going to be pretty damn suspicious. Wouldn't you guys agree? Looks suspicious. So someone that's not even in IT will think to themselves, you know what, that looks awfully suspicious to me. I'm not going to give this. But what if you or that someone receive an email and the email actually looks like it is from the bank. Now, in that case, maybe IT people will still not fall victim to this because we know what to look out for. But someone that is not in IT could actually very well fall victim to this now, which is why it is not uncommon to see phishing attacks combined with spoofing attacks. Same with a cell phone number, same with anything else. If I'm going to call you from a number that looks like it's from a legit source, you might be inclined more to give me what I'm looking for. So... What is the next topic here? Evil twin. The evil twin just on its own, that topic can mean a lot of things, guys. But this is actually specifically referring to something like an access point or a router. More commonly, a, an access point. So that is when you or someone goes and basically acquires or makes or gets themselves a second access point. And they will even go so far as to give this access point the same SSID. So server set identifier, that's the name of the Wi-Fi. So if your company has got a name on their hotspot or their Wi-Fi, let's just call this Wi-Fi 1 or whatever you want to go and call it. And I go and get myself another access point. Put it more or less in the same range and I give it the exact same name. So what I'm hoping to achieve here is I'm hoping to trick people into connecting on my access point instead of yours. So they're close enough to the point where you can pick them both up, you know, more or less the same range. They've got the same name. They've got the same everything. If you connect to mine, I might be doing something called harvesting. So as soon as you're on my access point, I'm going to be harvesting credentials and quite a few other things potentially that's of value now, obviously. And to kind of force people more onto mine, this is not compulsory, I might even go and do something with regards to your access point to kind of kick it off the list. I might go and overload it. I might go and cause some sort of denial of service attack on it. Basically, I'm going to go and cause some sort of shenanigans to kind of to mine, you know, instead of just leaving it a chance where it will be like a 50-50. I want to kind of not leave it a chance. So if you want to nudge people, you can kind of like make sure the other one is not available and there's multiple ways you can go and do that. All right, folks, moving on to threat types. Many, many types of threats out there when we talk about IT, but here is a couple for you guys, six to be precise. So starting with external versus internal threats. External, just to kind of, you know, give you guys a ballpark idea, is someone outside your house or probably outside your company. He or she does not have a device that belongs to you or your company, they do not have an account in your company. So they are really, really just going to go and break into your house or your company. It's probably going to be a company using their own devices and breaking into accounts or whatever it is they want to go and do. Internal threats is, for the most part, going to be your own staff. It's not limited to your own staff, but it will usually be your own staff. Now, that's a bit more risky, in my opinion, because these staff members, if they know something about something, they are already inside your network. Technically, to a certain degree, they've gotten past the firewall. And what makes this even more dangerous, you know, besides them being inside your network, they've actually got accounts. Some of them might even have some level of privilege. So that really becomes a bit of a concern right now when they've got privilege. Now, external and internal threats, they both have their own benefits, they both have their own drawbacks. <laughs> if you can call them benefits and drawbacks, I suppose that's probably the wrong way to approach this. So external people, generally these hackers know a little bit more. Um, the, the benefit here is they've got to go through a firewall, they've got no account and all that. And they're normally after something. They don't really care about damaging your company per se. 
mean, you do get those, and if they do, if they are gonna be out to damage your company, somebody an ex disgruntled employee or something, someone's got beef of you, your company. But usually, from my experience, when someone breaks into a company, you know, from external, it's because they're after something, something of value. Now, internal threats. These guys are not always after you know information. They might be, but usually these are disgruntled employees. Someone possibly did not get that annual increase or that bonus they were hoping for, or you know maybe that promotion they were hoping for. So internal threats are a bit of a concern. Now under threat types, we also have something called footprinting threats. This is when someone, it could be something, but it's usually someone is actively working to try and basically figure out what is what in your network. What do you have on your network? Where is it? Um, what kind of configuration do you have on it? So they want to maybe check if you've got any servers. If so, what kind of servers? What are the IP addresses? Where are they physically located? Do you have any firewalls protecting these servers? Do you have VLANs? Do you have this? Do you have that? So these people are actively working to try and figure out what is in your environment. They can do this by pinging, they can do this by running all kinds of software scans. Heck, they could even just ask normal questions as a human being. But footprinting is to trying to basically do scouting to try and figure out what people have in a network in the hopes of later on maybe misusing that and abusing that for some sort of attack. And then we've got spoofing threats. I think we kind of accidentally covered that in the previous topic. So spoofing, like I said previously, is forging something. Forging an IP, forging a MAC address, an email address, a phone number, that kind of stuff. So that is what forging is all about. You have something called on-path attacks. So you can think of this as two people communicating with one another over a network. So this could be one person sending another person an email. It can be one machine connecting to another machine over the network. Maybe a machine connecting to a server over the network. And the idea here is someone, this might be me, will be in the middle here and they will intercept that communication. And this could just be to see what it is, you know, in the hopes of getting something sensitive or valuable. Or, in some cases, I could even alter the original contents and then pass it on so the person that receives it, the server or the device that receives it, gets the wrong information. So this could be something really as simple as you sending an email to a coworker. I intercept that email just to view it, to see what it's about. Or I intercept it to go and alter your wording and then I send it on as if it was you. Then we have something called a denial of service attack, better known as a DOS attack, DOS attack. So you get different kinds, but this is the smaller kind. So denial of service attack could, honest to God, be an actual service that's being denied on your machine. It's not limited to that. So if you go into your Windows services, if you look at something like, if I have to suck it out of my thumb, something like the print spooler, very, very common service that gets attacked by this. So there are many kinds of denial service attacks and the most common one I've encountered in my career is the print spooler being denied in a normal desktop laptop kind of environment. As soon as that service is turned off, uh, you or the user would not be able to go and print. So therefore I'm denying you a service of some kind. What service are we denying? The print service. This can be any kind of service people. Uh, this can also be an internal website or a public website. It can be an internal server or a public server. I am denying you or use this access to some sort of service. The way I do that can be multiple ways. It can be a configuration hitting. It can be that I'm overloading this service. You know, by overloading it, it's going to bomb out and it's going to become non-responsive. You know, or I could just go and turn it off. Kind of like the service of the principal. Just turning it off, that's technically a denial of service attack, folks. Then we get something called a distributed denial of service attack. Um, this is also better known as DDoS attacks. So you'll see there's an extra D there. It's a much larger scale of what we just said. So this is when I go and deny a very large server, you know, cause some sort of large server to go offline or a very large public website or, you know, something in that regard. And this is done once again by overloading it. So if you look at something like a very large public website, they could potentially handle tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of devices at any given moment. How do you cause that website to go offline? Well, generally, we will go and overload it. Now, how the heck do you overload a website that can handle thousands of users? Well, by using a distributed denial of service attack. So for, um, I think, let's put this in a nutshell. So this is kind of like a piece of malware. That's the most common way I can probably approach this. A piece of malware that's going to go and infect many, many people's machines. It can be your machine and my machine, perhaps. 
It's going to run silent in the background. It's going to basically go and sap, let's say, like 1% of your CPU, 1% of your RAM, and so on. And, you know, I will probably not notice 1% of my resources missing. I will not. I might be in IT, but I'm not going to notice 1% missing. I will not. As a human, you cannot notice that missing. These machines are now actively what we call zombie PCs. They're part of what is known as a botnet. Bot network. We just call it a botnet. So... This malware spreads like wildfire. It infects many people's devices. And this is eventually going to come to a point where it will be thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of devices. Believe it or not, there are botnets out there that actually consist of so many devices that it's bigger than the population of a lot of countries. Bigger than the population of Brazil in some cases. These bot networks can be used to cause one heck of a massive denial of service attack. But it's not the only thing we use them for. So in this case, we're coming at it from a denial of service attack perspective. But these bot networks can be used to go and cause mass spam attacks, mass phishing attacks, mass password cracking. It's basically a supercomputer. I mean, if you've got 10,000 computers working together as one to crack the same password, that is technically a supercomputer, people. That's one of the ways I used to break into companies when I used to be a penetration tester. So that basically means they pay me to break into a company, legally speaking, of course. I didn't do anything illegal. So they would make a copy of my identification documents and all that. So if I get up to some sort of shenanigans, they can always backtrack me and all that, that kind of stuff afterwards. Now, speaking of breaking into companies, that brings us to our next topic in this section, which is actually the last topic in this first section, password attacks. So this course actually just has two that they mention in it, but I went and added a third one for you guys because I feel you need to know it. So the first one that they mentioned, which actually is part of the, the, the course, is an attack called a dictionary attack. So it really is part of the course. It's not something you guys need to worry about. So a dictionary attack is pretty much exactly like the name suggests. It's an attack that's going to go and use actual words from the dictionary to try and guess someone or something's password. Doesn't really work though these days. I mean, if you look at something like a server or domain environment, if you look at pretty much any website, any platform these days, almost all of them, annoyingly so much so, will force you or the users to go and use a secure password. So if you go to something as simple and relatable as something that's like, let's say, Facebook, you'll find if you go and choose a password, it's going to force the average person to have at least an eight character password, if not longer, has to be uppercase lowercase numbers and symbols at the end of the day what are you left with not an actual english word or any word for that matter from any language so therefore a dictionary attack would not work does not work on pretty much everything these days so it's something we speak about kind of like now but it's kind of like talking about history so i suppose we could throw it into the history books but it's not something we actually use anymore and it doesn't actually really work anymore the second kind of attack, which we are going to talk about here, it's not actually one in this course, but I threw it for you guys in as an extra one, is an attack called a rainbow table attack. I wouldn't worry about being asked about this one in the exam, since it's not actually in the course, but I feel you guys need to know about it. So what is a rainbow table attack? That is when you or someone go and compile a list of passwords, which you know is very, very, very likely to go and get a hit. So this is when you understand or know someone very well, or you understand or know something or a certain component very well. So if I have to go and give you guys a very simple example by summarizing the heck out of this, that would be kind of like using the default passwords on a router. Most technicians, including myself, and probably very soon you guys, normally know what the default passwords are for most routers and most devices out there. Now, knowing that, I can actually go and make a list. I don't even have to go and write the, down, the list down officially. It's just kind of like a mental list. I can go and use that list of passwords, which is maybe five or ten passwords long. And if I try each and every one of those passwords, the chances are very likely that I am going to get a hit and I'm going to get into your device. So that's one of the golden rules of IT, why we keep saying you should always change the default password. Would it be your router, your access point, your firewall, your whatever. One of the golden rules in IT is you always change the default password. Now you know why. Because technicians like me and like you guys will know what these default passwords are from the factory. And we can actually very well, if we really want to, we can go and take advantage of that by using the rainbow table concept. The third one we're going to talk about here, which was actually one in the course, 
and this is probably one of the most dangerous ones and the most widely used used ones, is a brute force attack. Now that's basically just guessing someone's password. And saying it like that kind of sounds silly, it doesn't sound that scary, but trust me, this is the most dangerous one. So when we say guessing someone's password, we don't really mean use a human being with a keyboard and try all possible combinations. I mean, sure, it's possible, but that's not going to work. It's going to take forever, it's just not going to work. So what we do here in these situations is we normally use a computer to do the guessing work for us. It's going to try all password combinations, you know, so it's going to try each and every letter and number and symbol on the keyboard until eventually one day it gets a hit. So the longer the password is, the more complex it is, the longer it takes to crack that password, which is one of the reasons you'll find most platforms and most servers and most environments force you to have a minimum length in your password. Minimum 8 characters. And sometimes they'll make this 10 characters or 12 characters even longer. Now you know why. The longer the password and the more complex it is, the longer it takes to crack that password. By the time I crack it off my computer, that password would have expired 3 or 4 times over. It's not going to work. Or I might not even never crack that password for that matter. Now, when it becomes a bit of a situation is when someone like me uses a supercomputer to crack that password. Something like that botnet we spoke about earlier. Using all of those tens of thousands of machines together to try and guess the same password for the same machine, that might actually very well get me into your machine before the password expires. And that's actually how I got into most companies back in the day. All right, folks, that brings an end to the first main section in this module. I believe that is the longest section in this module. The other ones are actually very short and very straightforward. So the second main section in this module, which is relatively short, is compare wireless security protocols. There's pretty much, for the most part, just one main topic we're going to be talking about in this section, folks. And that's the different kinds of security encryption we get for these wireless networks. Now, the old A+, used to have three, I'm going to list four of you guys, we'll get to that in a moment. The previous version of A+, being the 1000 series, used to have three wireless encrypted standards that you need to know. All three of these will be asked in the exam, multiple times will they actually ask you about it in the exam, and, yep, and, there used to be, well, there probably still is, a PBQ in the exam about this. A PBQ, for those of you that don't know, PBQ stands for performance-based question. It's basically a simulation. It's a simulation in the exam, and this simulation is when you get presented with a router, you have to log into this router in the exam, you've got to go and browse on this router in the exam, and you've got to go choose the most secure wireless encryption in the exam. That's what they require you to go and do. Now, obviously, these questions are subject to change. I mean, CompTIA reserves the right to go and change this at any point in time. The last time I checked, though, that is what the PBQ was. At that point in time, there was only three wireless encryptions. Now there's four. But this course, the new 1100 series, which we're doing right now, it only covers three. And you might say, okay, cool. So is it the same three as the previous course? Uh, no. The oldest one in the previous course has been removed. And the new one, which has been added, that one has now been added. So we still got just three, but they've removed the oldest one. I am still, however, going to list all four for you guys. So starting at the top, here we've got something called WEP. So that's a wireless encryption. It's the first one, it's the oldest one. And that's the one that's now been removed from this new course. It's actually not even in this course anymore. But I'm mentioning it to you guys so that you know where we're coming from. Now the second one here, which is the second oldest, is something called WPA. Now from here, it actually is in the course. The third one is even newer. And newer is usually better. So the more newer this stuff gets, the more secure it gets. So the third one here, folks, is WPA2. The fourth one and the last one, and this is the one I've added to the course now, this new version of the course, is WPA3. You see, it's actually not that difficult to get this stuff in the right order. So the very first one on the list, guys, remember the top? That was the first one. That's the oldest one. The first and the oldest one is the least secure out of these lot. Now, looking down the list, the very, very last one there, WPA3, that's the last one, it's the latest one, and it's the most secure one. Now, as I've said earlier, you are going to get asked about this in the exam. For the most part, it'll just be normal theory questions. They'll ask you a question. They will present you four possible answers. And out of those four possible answers, you can usually just choose one. Sometimes they'll say choose two or choose three, but for the most part, you're going to be able to choose only one. So they will give you a couple of answers. 
And they'll say, which one of the following is the most secure wireless encryption? Or which one of the following is the least secure? And in that list of possible answers, which is probably going to be about four, you're going to look for these answers and you're going to go choose the least secure or the most secure. Once again, least secure, WEP. Most secure, WPA3. Now there's a catch in the exam though. They will go and change the answers a little bit. You'll find out of those four possible answers, the ones we see in front of us is usually not going to be your four possible answers. It might be, but it's usually not. So you're going to get two answers, which is from this list in front of us. And the other two answers are going to be something completely random that's got nothing to do with the question. So they might give you the first one on this list and the third one on this list. And they'll ask you, which one is the least secure or which wireless encryption is the most secure? Now, if you see only WPA2 and WEP on that list of answers of this, the least secure will be WEP. The most secure would be obviously, well, WPA2 then. WPA3 is more secure, but since it's not on the list, it obviously falls away and you go click back to the next one on the list. If I give you, for example, only WPA and WPA2, those two in the middle, and I ask you, which one is the least secure? It's going to be WPA. That's the least secure because it's the oldest one out of two. If I ask you out of those two in the middle, which one is the most secure? It'll be WPA2. So as long as you understand, it just falls back to the previous one. And the previous one, we talk about, you know, less secure. And if we talk about more secure, just keep going down, down the list. So it's just, as long as you understand the order, you can't get these questions wrong. <coughs> now as for the PPQ, before anyone asks me about that in the, in the comment section, like I said, They'll present you with a router. I wouldn't worry about it. It's a very simple router. It's got literally only three tabs. A real life router has got many, many tabs and all of these tabs have got many, many, many sub tabs and links and buttons and stuff. In the exam, it's a router. It's got three tabs. There's hardly anything on these tabs. You are allowed to browse the router in the exam. You do not lose marks for that. So if you want to explore, you're welcome to do so. What I want you to look for in that situation is there's normally going to be a drop down list. It says wireless security or wireless encryption or wireless something like that. And read the question very slowly and carefully. It normally says choose the most secure wireless encryption. So if you see all four of these in the list, you're going to go and choose WPA3. If you do not see WPA3 in that list, you're going to go and choose the next one, which will probably be WPA2. So they'll probably ask you to choose the most secure, but just in case. The question is in reverse, and they ask you to go and choose the less secure one, the least secure one, that will be WEP, or whatever other option they've got available in that list, of course. Right, folks, like I said, this second main section is a relatively short one, a very straightforward one, but it's a very, very important one, nonetheless. So that brings us to the third main section of this module, nice and short, very smooth. So the third main section of this module is configure Soho router security. So rephrasing that, that would be configure small office, home office router security. All right, so starting with home router setup. And with regards to that, we're going to be talking about physical placement and secure locations. So when it comes to your home router setup, you're going to have to go make sure where do you place this router for more than one reason. So it's very important where you place this in a small office, a home office environment or your home environment, because obviously it's going to be broadcasting wirelessly. So if it's, if it's going to be broadcasting wirelessly and you want people to connect to this network wirelessly with phones and tablets and laptops and stuff, you want this device preferably as center as possible, as central as possible. Sorry, pronouncing that stuff incorrectly. Otherwise, if you put it on the edge of the house or the edge of the building, the other half of the building will have absolutely no signal. It's a bit of a problem. So for people communicating to your network or connecting to it, yes, you want to get it as center as possible. Central, there I go again pronouncing it incorrectly. But regarding placement, never mind getting it in the center of your, your building or your house, you also need to be careful, you know, in the sense of it should not be easily accessible for the general public. If it's your home environment, it probably doesn't matter that much because just friends and family is going to be coming over. But if it's an office environment and it's going to be public people coming into your office, you do not want that router being accessible to the general public because they can go and do all kinds of shenanigans on it. So ideally, as central space as possible, but also as secure as possible. Once you've decided on where you want to go and place this little device, there's a couple of things you need to go and do, folks. The first of which is management IP address. 
So you're always going to go and change the default IP address and you're always going to go and change the default password like we said earlier. The password is probably the most important thing here is to go and make sure you change the default password. Otherwise, someone like me or someone else can go and do what we call a rainbow table attack on your device. Now, why do we need to go and change the default IP first? That for security? Yeah, I suppose, but that's not the main reason. The main reason is to avoid conflict, in my opinion. Most devices out there that you go and connect to a network for the first time have the same IP, folks. That IP is usually 192.168.0.1 or it might be 1.1 1 .1 at the end. Now, if you go and introduce your very first device into your network, that's not a problem. But as soon as you provide a second device and a third device and a fourth device into the network, which has got the exact same IP address, that's a problem because they're going to cancel one another out. So as soon as you log into your, as soon as you connect your first device into the network, you want to go and change the default password, but you also want to change the IP to anything but that default IP. Once you've done that, as soon as you bring a new device into the network, at least they will not go and cancel one another out. At least you can go and log in and use these devices as they were intended. All right, moving on to home router LAN and wireless LAN configuration. Now, there's a bit of a picture for you guys on the right. So that is of a TP-Link, not that it matters. So that's the brand. You can actually even see the model there below the name that says TP-Link, not that it matters. So I cannot tell you guys, hey, this is what a router will look like, or hey, this is what you will find on the router, because every router out there is kind of unique. So even if you go and buy the exact same brand as me, but your model is different, it's not going to be the same place where you'll find things, guys. The good news here is, before you guys go into a panic, these things are of such nature that it's very easy and user-friendly to find what you're looking for. So even if you've never been into your router or your class router before, you can figure out what you're looking for or find it very, very quickly, even though you've never actually been in there. So one of the very first things we normally go and configure on a LAN, especially a wireless LAN, is the service set identifier, better known as SSID. I did kind of briefly mention this to you guys earlier. So for that, that, that would be, for those of you who don't know, the name of your wireless network. So if you're in your home, you might want to go make it your name, your last name, you know, something in that regard. If you're at your office, it might be the name of your company or a variation thereof. Or you can just go and call it whatever. You can call it Banana Town if you really want to. So technically, the name doesn't really matter. In the, the day, people can go and still go and connect to it. But if you're looking at this, you know, from a company perspective, um, and you're going to possibly have guests and people at that company, you want to probably go and give it something, you know, some sort of professional user-friendly name. It very easily allows users to identify which network this is, who it belongs to. And even if they know who it belongs to, some companies have got many, many Wi-Fi connections, hotspots. So they need to know which one they're connecting to. Are they connecting to the right one? So it's very important to go and give it a very professional, proper name that is not the default name. Choosing a non-default name, in other words. All right, and then something else you need to go and configure, which we kind of covered in the previous section, never mind the previous topic, is encryption settings. So somewhere on your router, there's going to be an encryption setting section. It's usually a drop-down list. It will say security, wireless security, or encryption, or wireless encryption, you know, one of those words. And in that drop-down list, assuming it's a drop-down list, you will go and choose the relevant wireless encryption. Very important, you go and choose the most secure, which is usually going to be WPA2 on most devices. But maybe if you're lucky, some of these newer, newer devices will have WPA3. But from my experience at this point in time, most devices still only have WPA2 as the most secure one. Last thing I'm going to mention here under this topic for you guys is disabling guest access. Surprisingly, this is on actually on a lot of routers and for a lot of people. And that's not a good thing. Anyone that knows about this can take advantage of that. So whenever you or someone does not need guest access to be open, like a guest Wi-Fi or a guest account or a guest whatever, you want to go and disable that account or disable that frequency or whatever so it cannot be taken advantage of. So if you don't use something, kill it. If you don't use something, turn it off, disable it so that something cannot go and take advantage of that something. All right, folks, that is the end of the third section, also very short. The fourth and the last section here is summarize security measures. Now, in this section, it's also going to be short, maybe a little bit longer than the previous two sections, but still short. Like I said in the beginning, First section is the longest one out of the lot here. Um, section two and three is relatively short. Section four is a little bit longer, but section four is not really something you need to know for the exam. 
Um, at least not the last time I checked. So if you guys feel like you're only preparing for the exam, then you can actually skip this, this part and you can go straight to the next module, which is module 17. You can go watch that video. Um, but if you're curious or if you're not just studying for the exam, then you know what? Watch this, this section as well. So starting at physical access controls. So physical is something you can usually touch as a human being of your hands. So physical access controls at site and premises security systems. How, what would that be, guys? So that would be something like a security camera, a security guard, a boom gate, a door, a lock. You know, you see where we're going with that. So that is what physical access control is all about. Now, what is perimeter security? I think some people pronounce this as perimeter, perimeter security. Um, I think the correct way is probably perimeter security. So if correct me in the comment section if I'm wrong, you know, how do we pronounce that? Other way, what is it though? It is fences and bollards. That's what perimeter security is. Then we've got access control vestibules. So I think that is what basically allows people to um, go only one in at a time. I stand to be corrected. If I'm not mistaken, I think that will probably be something like a turnstile. You get some of these turnstiles that might only allow one person in at a time. Once again, if I'm wrong, you can go and correct me in the comment section down below, but I believe that is something like a turnstile. You'll find that some banks and some jewelry stores, they might also have something to a certain degree like that, which only allows in one person at a time, so that if they suspect something funky is going on, they can actually trap you in there if need be. You've got something like magnetometers. So I think you can kind of guess what that one is about by looking at the name. It is something we use to detect metal. It's a good old fashioned metal detector, which is for the most part used for detecting weapons, but it's obviously not limited to that. So a magnetometer is a metal detector to prevent unauthorized access and to prevent unauthorized items. I'm just going to say items because I don't want the YouTube police on my case for saying certain words on this channel. The last one here, guys, is security guards. Did mention it earlier at the first point there. We know what a security guard is. Everybody knows what a security guard is. So these are to enforce and monitor security systems and support your users, depending on what exactly you've hired your security guards for, I suppose. All right, and then moving on to one of our last topics. I don't think it's the last one yet. I think this is the second last one. Lock types. All right, so there's a bit of a picture for you guys there on the right. I don't know why they've put that picture there. That's a picture for Comtia. That looks more like a privacy screen to me, in my opinion, but it does look like it's got a bit of a lock there. If you look at underneath the fingers, it looks like they're trying to turn a key there. But if you look at that mesh, metal, whatever screen, that's actually a privacy screen. So if you press your nose up against it, you can kind of see what's, you know, on the other side of that fence, or that screen. But if you stand about a couple of feet away, you cannot actually see through it. At least that's the idea. So that's why we call it a privacy screen, or at least a variation of that. But we're getting sidetracked here. This is not actually what the topic is about. The topic is about lock types. So you get door locks. When we talk about door locks, you get key operated. Probably the most simple kind that we all have and know. You get electronic doors, electronic locks. You get the kind of doors that works with badges. They read a badge, fancy, fancy. And then you get another kind that works with biometric scanners. They normally require you to go and use your fingerprint. It's going to go and scan your fingerprint. It's going to go and unlock it. It could be another variation of biometric. I mean, I've seen some doors that go and scan your eyes. I think they call it like a, like a retinal eye scan or something. And if it turns out to be you, then the door will unlock. But... You know, normally the fingerprint one is the more common one here. We also have something called equipment locks. So equipment locks is something we're going to talk about again in a later module. I think if I'm not mistaken, that is something we talk about in the last module again. We actually have pictures of it. But to give you guys a ballpark idea of what an equipment lock is, you'll find a computer cases, the actual desktop computer cases. What a lot of people will do, especially at companies where people are prone to steal hardware and stuff, they will go and lock the case. And they will even go and chain the case down to a table or something. This is not possible of all cases. You normally, there will be like a little lip sticking out the back and you can go and use a chain that looks something like a bike chain. So that can be done with desktop PCs. It's more common to see this of laptops though. Some laptops, not all, have a special slot on them. We can go and slide in a little chain. It looks like a bike chain. I kid you not, it looks like a bike chain. It clicks into place in that laptop. In that chain, you can now go and tie it to something like a table. Preferably a mounted table, otherwise they're going to carry the table out with the laptop. You never know, people are crazy. So preferably something mounted, something solid. You're going to go and tie the laptop down to that, and this will very often work with like a combination lock. So it very, very, very much is like a bike chain. I mean, it's kind of just a stronger, in my opinion, because it looks like 
a bike chain. It's got a steel cable inside. It's got a little plastic coating around it. So it's for the most part like a bike chain. Except this is now for laptops and desktop PCs. So that's what we mean by equipment locks. Now more on that once we get to that topic in the last module, folks. Now speaking of the last module, here is the last topic in this section for this module, folks. Alarms and surveillance. Once again, I feel it's redundant for me to even mention these topics because everybody knows what this is without me even explaining it. You don't even need to be an IT. So regarding alarms and surveillance, let's talk about alarms first. What is that? It's something you can go and install in your house, small office or big office environment. And the idea here is it's supposed to detect intruders and, you know, alert you or the authorities. It's going to make a loud sound. Some of them might be silent. But the general gist here is it's supposed to alert you or the authorities or both of some sort of in, um, intruder or unauthorized access. Video surveillance is not there to stop someone, though. So video surveillance is to catch people, you know, so that you can go and see who it was afterwards. So it's not to stop them. It's not to prevent them in any way. It is just to discourage them or to catch them afterwards by seeing who it actually was that did what and when and where and all that kind of stuff. All right, folks, I hope you've learned something in this module. If you have, do your homie a favor and boink the like button. It helps me out a lot when you do that. I really appreciate it if you guys do. If you'd like to know when module 17 for A plus comes out or one of my other videos, maybe consider subscribing or, well, don't. It's your choice. Guys, before you disappear, a special thank you to the Patreon and PayPal sponsors and obviously everybody else as well that's been sponsoring me. So there is the list like usual of all the Patreon sponsors. I mean, it used to be a list for just PayPal and Patreon on the same page, but they've got too many of you guys, so now I've got to split it. So there is the Patreon sponsors. Guys, I appreciate you very much. Thank you for continuously supporting this channel. Cannot be done without you guys. There is a list of all the PayPal donations coming in. So thank you very much, guys. I appreciate it very much. And I also want to shout out to those of you clicking on the thanks button below the video, just buying me a coffee or whatever. If you'd like to do the same or sponsor me in some small way, you can find all that information in the video description down below, folks. Lastly, folks, um, for those of you that's interested, this is completely optional. There is a Discord server. So if you know Discord, if you have Discord, feel free to join my Discord server if you feel like you want to go and do that. You can find that way at the bottom in my video description. So if you open my video description, way at the bottom, there's a link to my Discord server. It's called Free IT Training. It's a community of IT people like myself. Most of the people in that community are studying something like A+, but there's also people in there that already has A+, that's got the knowledge, and we're there to help you or whoever. So if you are studying and you need some assistance, feel free to join that server, or if you feel like you want to help some other people because you might know some of the stuff, Either way, potato, potato, feel free to join that IT community. It's completely free of charge. And um, who knows, you might make some friends, you might have some fun while doing it. All right, guys, see you in module 17 of the CompTIA A-plus course.